Thank you. It is a great honor to be here. I was delighted to be invited. You would not understand my attempt to speak in German, so I will use English. And I was invited to talk about a man called Emmanuel Goldberg. And I thought this is a good idea for the theme of total recall, because there is an irony. And the irony is that the history of recall has been largely forgotten. That's a good irony to consider. I will talk a little bit about memory as the combination of recording and recall. I will speak briefly about my concept of the long-term history. I will mention some pioneers, and if there is still time, I will talk a little bit about my ideas of future development. Now, people speak of the information society as modern. Th this is total nonsense because all societies, all groups, are formed by collaboration and communication. So prehistoric societies were information societies. The difference is really in the increase in documents and records. It's more accurate to speak of the rise of a document society. So since prehistoric times, I find it helpful to think in terms of four vectors, lines of development. Writing as an alternative to speech. It makes speech permanent or unnecessary. Who could imagine living without writing? Speech ends when you stop speaking, but writing continues. It resists time, and usually you can move it, so it also resists distance. And printing is an extreme multiplication of writing. The telecommunications until the 19th century was to get on a horse or a boat and go somewhere and tell them. The use of the semaphore, the railways, telephone, radio, internet, these are relatively modern. They resist the effects of distance and of delays. There has been an enormous amount of analysis and history and writing and theory about writing and printing and telecommunications. Very little about copying techniques, which began in the 20th century with photographic techniques and then uh, Xerox techniques. Now, the consequences of these lines of technical development resulted in what in the 19th century was called the information flood. In the 20th century, it was called the information explosion. And now we call it big data. But it also reflects the complexity of society, the division of labor. We are more dependent on each other you do not grow the food you eat, you do not make the clothes you wear, you do not build the technology you use. You depend on other people, and the way that you depend on other people is through records, documents, messages. And this creates the need to, this creates a new problem. You need another technology, the technology of recall, of search and selection and finding. You need indexes and catalogs and search engines. That is the area that I am interested in. And also, you still have the problem of trusts. trust. I am sure that a prehistoric Austrian would have problems to know whether to trust another prehistoric Austrian. It's not a new problem, but with the information flood, explosion, big data, it's increasingly a problem. So, 
a forgotten pioneer decided to solve the problem. Martin Schrettinger was a monk in Munich and he made the abbot angry and the abbot punished him by telling him to go and work in the library of the monastery. Schrettinger found that the library was more interesting than being a monk. I could tell him that. But he decided that here was a challenge because you cannot depend on the librarian. I mean, I, I'm a librarian, but a librarian will forget, a librarian will go to another library, a librarian will die. So you cannot depend on the memory of the librarian, so you need to build a technical system, an apparatus that will continue if the librarian dies. It's a very simple idea. He said it's very simple technology, and he wrote a book, and he invented the phrase Bibliothek Wissenschaft. That was in 1808. And then another wave of people, there was Paul Otley that Professor Hartman has talked about. Here the idea is that you can find materials and you can write a book, but books are inefficient and duplicative and they're out of date. You should take the facts out of the book and put them into a random access system using cards. And here you see the same illustration. Another interesting pioneer was the Nobel laureate in chemistry, Wilhelm Ostwald. Very interested in the organization of research. The international paper sizes, A4, etc., are from Ostwald. He was so excited when he went to the 1910 World Fair in Brussels and he met Paul Otley that he went back to Germany and he used his Nobel Prize money to solve the world's information problems. He created an organization which he called the Bridge, Die Brücke, in Munich, to connect the scholars. His concept was that in those days, intellectual workers were isolated, like islands in an archipelago. So you needed to make bridges between the islands to connect them into a network. Here is an illustration from uh, uh, one of his publications. Unfortunately, the bridge collapsed. It ran out of money. And again, it's the same idea of little pieces of knowledge. And you can think in terms of a kind of rigorous Wikipedia on cards. But cards do not scale. The more cards, the more expensive it is to work. He spoke of Das Gehirn der Welt with great enthusiasm. He meant really a world memory, but he wanted more because he thought that if you had all these concepts and facts, you could rearrange them and generate new knowledge, new facts, new combinations, as you do in chemistry. It was a chemist's idea. Now he's forgotten, Otley was forgotten, Schrettingen was forgotten, and the received history, the accepted history that everybody knew, was this man, a man called Vannevar Bush, a very successful, ambitious engineer from Massachusetts, he was responsible for the scientific effort in the United States to win the Second World War. And the National Science Foundation was his idea. So he clearly was important and he deserves respect. But he gets respect for the wrong reason. He tried to develop a retrieval system on microfilm which he called the microfilm rapid selector. There is a picture here. This is an artist's design. It's not effective, but at the top, there are two windows for images. 
See, multi-windows is not new. This is 1945. On the right is a keyboard, and on the left is a scanner. And underneath, there's all kinds of microfilm and cameras and mechanisms. And he wrote an essay. He worked on that from 1938 for a couple of years. And then he wrote an essay, As We May Think. And it was very well written. It's not a good essay, but it's well, it's well written. And it's persuasive. And it makes people enthusiastic. And it had enormous influence on American people who developed hypertext systems and computers. So that, that was the history that people knew, not the people I mentioned before. Here is a picture of one of these machines. It's big. Here is a librarian standing by it. What you see is reels of 30 millimeter micro, 35 millimeter film, not magnetic. Um, but the more that I was interested in the past, the more I began to think that this story of Bush cannot be complete. There must be more. And I began to read about people in Europe before Bush's time and the ideas they had. And I came across uh, a brilliant French woman, Suzanne Brier, who wrote most interesting ideas and was forgotten. And I read about Paul Ottley, and I was intrigued. I said, there must be more to this story. So I decided to look. And I could remember only one person who had criticized Bush, an Englishman, Robert Fairthorne. And I knew him. He was a very intelligent man. He knew a lot. I trusted uh, Fairthorne. And I found an article which said, Bush's paper was timely, even though few of his ideas were original. The rapid selector itself had probably been realized as a workable device by E. Goldberg of the Zeiss Company around 1930. Now, this is 10 years before Bush. But I never heard of E. Goldberg. Uh, or my friends had not heard of E. Goldberg. I looked in encyclopedias, I could find no E. Goldberg. Who was he? What did he do? And who knew about him? I am a librarian, I said. I will find it out. Librarians get the best library service. So I went to the library and for a long time I found nothing. Nothing. But then I found that a Russian student in Leipzig, had received a PhD in 1906. And my library had a copy of this in Berkeley. And German doctoral dissertations of this period have the resume, the, the, the curriculum vita of the student in the back. And here we have a picture of the Russian student with his Russian family. And then on the right, we have the same student with his fiancée. The question was, was this Russian student, E. Goldberg, the same one as Robert Fairthorne's E. Goldberg? So I built a bibliographical bridge. I, I, I found obscure indexes to German technical literature, and I looked for 1906 to see did anybody publish with the name E. Goldberg? And then 1907 and 1908. And then I went to 1930, 1929. You get the idea. And in fact, they did connect. And it was mostly in photographic technology. And this is the man. The other, the other fact was, consider if you were in Dresden in 1930, and your name was Emanuel Goldberg, you were probably Jewish, a Russian Jew in Dresden in 1930 was not going to remain healthy in Dresden after 1930s. 
So I looked for, I found him in the end in a directory of refugees from the Nazis. Born in Moscow, 1881. Because of anti-Semitism in Russia, he came to Germany to get away from anti-Semitism at the beginning of the 20th century. There are ironies in life. And he liked to say he was a chemist by learning. He wanted to be an engineer in the Imperial Technical Institute in Moscow, and he got wonderful scores for admission, but only 3% of the students were permitted to be Jewish. And one other student had the same scores, the best, equal, and was Jewish also. So they used a coin and only one was admitted and it was not Goldberg, so he had to study chemistry. And he went to Germany and he was very productive as an academic and a teacher in a whole range of things to do with light and images. He joined the Academy of Graphic Arts and Bookcraft in uh, Leipzig, um, the one that is now called the Hochschule for Graphic and Bookkunst. And here is a caricature of the professors, and that is him. And this is a story I like to tell to my students. Goldberg, when the First World War developed, Goldberg's Doktorvater, the director of the research, went into the army and fought on the Western Front. So Goldberg went himself, not as a soldier, but as a volunteer to help his Doktorvater. I think that's very good. I tell my students about that. Here is Goldberg on the Western Front with his uh, dissertation director and they worked on aerial photography of enemy trenches uh, from these balloons. And the Zeiss company was very interested in technology that the army would buy from them. So he was recruited to Zeiss to modernize their products, first in the camera factory, Ica, in Dresden. And then in 1926, four firms were created to make Zeiss Econ, which at that time was one of the great high-tech firms of the world. He developed a very small movie camera that you could use to make films of your family. He liked skiing. This is a drawing of, this is Goldberg on the right with his camera and his skis. And here are some films he made with himself. The device had a delayed action. You arrange the, the camera you set a timer and then you go. So he was the camera builder, the producer, the director and the actor all in one. So here is a film he makes of himself. Now, in the top left, there is a little boy. He was eight years old. And in the lower one, the same little boy, Herbert. And then on the right is Goldberg's family with a little boy. I found the little boy in Massachusetts 70 years later. And that was very helpful. And the little girl lives in Tel Aviv. And at that time, the lights company had introduced the Leica camera. This was a very successful product. And Zeisikon had to have a, pro uh, a product to compete with the Leica. And they developed the Contax, a very, very sophisticated camera. But Goldberg also did research, and he was interested in microfilm, and he said, how small can we go? And in 1925, he gave out this souvenir at a conference. The reduction is so small that you could get the entire text of the Bible 50 times on one square inch. This is very, very small. You make it by using a micro microscope as a camera. It's complicated, it's clever. We don't have time. Um, but it's too small. It's like storage on DNA. Uh, it's clever, it's very compact, but it's not cost effective. 
Instead, he used 35 millimeter film, which was technology that his company developed. He was the boss. And here are some examples. You have the image of a page, and then in between, you have the indexing, the metadata. On the left, it is letters and numbers, and on the right, you have opaque, or you have dots, which is easier from a technical point of view. Imagine a cinema projector. You have a light on the left, you have the film in the middle, and here you have the query, the search card. This card defines what you're looking for, in this case expressed as dots. The search card blocks almost all of the light except for three very thin lines. And as the film goes through, if three opaque dots are exactly in the right place, they block the rest. Pattern recognition, no light to the photocell, the photocell generates no electricity. Eureka, you have found it. Uh, this is the patent, the, the American patent, submitted in 1928. First was German in 1927. He demonstrated this in 1931. He also had a variation where you could use a telephone handset. You could dial uh, your query into the telephone. And he also had a design for remote access. You could do it over the telephone lines remotely that in 1949. It was not built, it was a design. That is 14 years before the first computer search, first remote computer search. 1933, he's kidnapped from his office at Saisikon by Nazis. He is taken into the forest, he's tied to a tree for some days, and he must write this letter of resignation. And he disappears. His successor at Zeisikon, a man called Heinz Kuppenbender, he takes credit for the modernization of Zeisikon and especially for the contacts. If you look in the literature on camera history, you find Kuppenbender as the inventor of the contacts. Kuppenbender was very successful in the Nazi period. Uh, he recommended uh, forced labor. Uh, he became very powerful. And his story of the early history of Zeiss Econ was the corporate story. And the Zeiss company has always been very effective in its publicity. And so you had corporate histories that do not mention the founding general director, even in 2000. So Goldberg has been erased from his company. And then there is this bizarre case. J. Edgar Hoover, another powerful, nasty man, wrote an article in the Reader's Digest boasting about how the Federal Bureau of Investigation had caught some German spies and had got some micro dots from them. The truth is the British intelligence gave them to Hoover, but he does not explain that. And then you have this strange story. The spy says, I have been a student at the Nazi espionage school, Klopstock Pension, Hamburg. And in the story it says he had studied under the famous Professor Zapp, inventor of the microdot at the Technical High School in Dresden. There never was a Professor Zapp in Dresden, never. It was invented by Professor Goldberg because he was an honorar professor at the Technical University. So it's right, it was invented in Dresden, it was invented at the Technical University, but not Zapp. If you go to look in the bookshop, in the section on espionage, there's books on espionage, and you look for microdots, you will find now 60 years later, the inventor was Professor Zapp. We know that because J. Edgar Hoover wrote an article in the Reader's Digest, but it's all wrong. Instead, we have Vannevar Bush, and as we may think, 
In fact, Goldberg escaped. There were protests in Dresden. The industrialists in Dresden did not like the idea that industrialists could be kidnapped. And they went to Berlin and they made a fuss. And Goldberg was released. He was healthy, but he was badly traumatized. And he went to France. And then he went to Palestine. He thought it would be a good idea if there was one place in the world where it's okay to be a Jew. So he went to Palestine and he started a new laboratory and he was largely responsible for the early development of the high-tech industry in Israel. There were no technical people, so he developed an apprenticeship scheme, Lehrlinge, with his daughter's high school friends. Here they are. This is 1941. The girl in the middle is his daughter, Hava. I think there are many interesting lessons from this story. It took me many years to do this story, and it was extremely interesting. I interviewed many of these teenagers, but of course they're not teenagers anymore. They were teenagers in 1941, and now most of the people I talk to are, have, are dead. When we talk about recall and memory and knowledge, we use metaphors a lot. It's normal to use metaphors. But metaphors are also problematic. Knowledge is what some person knows and it dies when they know. Anything else is a record of knowledge. Computers are not brains. Robots are not people. Robotic seals are not seals either. Records are not memory. Recall is not understanding. History is not the past. The past is gone. You cannot go there. You can't go there. The best you can do is to have a narrative, a story about the past, but it's incomplete. There are many of them. They're different. Remembering like history, is culturally based. It was a great pleasure to hear Professor Asman on Friday talk about Haldvax and the notion of a social frame. We understand only in terms of our cultural context, our own. And we can only understand Goldberg in the context of his cultural context. So there's a double problem of culture necessary to understand what happened. And there are many accidents in this story. Now consider the following. I think of this, for example. If Koppenbender or Hoover um, or the others had been more honest, then we would know more about Goldberg. In the bombing of Dresden, what if the bombs had fallen differently? The center of Dresden was destroyed, you know. Zeisikon had two large factories. One was near the center, the Enemann Werke. Another was further out, the Ica Werke. Now the Ica Werke was destroyed and all its documents and all the documents about Goldberg. The Enemann Werke, which was nearer the center, was not damaged. Its documents survived. If the bombs had fallen a little differently and destroyed the Enemann Werke instead of the Ica Werke, then the documentation about Goldberg would have survived. There are so many accidents. From a historical po historiographical point of view, the story is very interesting. Well, um, now you can find out about Emanuel Goldberg. I wrote a book after 15 years' work, and it has been published in German, thanks to Professor Hartmann. And if you go to my website, you can find plenty, and the official text of my paper I will put there. But if I have a few minutes longer, um, I would like to think a little bit about the future. Very quick. I spoke of four vectors of development. And I think that if you look at the logic of writing, it becomes the recording of everything, because writing is a form of recording. 
And if you look at printing, I think it becomes the reproducing of anything. Think of the 3D printers at Ars Electronica. The logic of printing, I think, is the reproduction of everything. And the logic of telecommunication leads to simultaneous, the effect of simultaneous interaction. And copying is not simply copying because to make a copy you have to analyze the characteristics of what you copy photographically. It leads to analysis and representation and visualization. New genres come and go and you have media conversion. So we are moving to much more than a flood and much more interrelated and much more in quantity. So what is the problem for the future of recall? Now we think more of data than of text because more of scholarship is in the form of databases. So if you ask the following question, if a scholar wants to make use of data that was created by somebody else before for some other reason at some other time, what are the conditions for you to use that person's data with success? I think you can do it different ways, but I think here is a list. You will not have any success if you do not know his data exists. So you must discover that it exists. And even if you know that it, he created it, you must find the copy. Very simple. And is it in a condition that is usable? Maybe it's a floppy disk that cannot be read. And do you have permission to use it? And is it standardized enough to be worth your while to make use of it? And do you really know what it represents? It may, he's gone, he's gone, he's dead. Uh, do you really understand what the data represents? Usually people do not make enough description. Are you going to trust it? And do you know what it means? I mean, it may mean something to him at his time that he did not fully describe. You have to get into his mind to understand it in your terms. This, these are the sorts of conditions. These are different problems that require different solutions. But that list came from a list made 20 years ago of what do you need in bibliography to find printed books or manuscripts. It is the same problem. The technology is different, but fundamentally the problem is the same and there's a lot of work to be done. So 